Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When John the Baptist heard in prison of the works of the Christ, he sent his disciples to Jesus with this question. Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus said to them, reply, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind regain their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news proclaimed to them. And blessed is the one who takes no offense at me. As they were going off, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out to the desert to see? A reed swayed in the womb by the wind? Then what did you go out to see? Someone dressed in fine clothing? Those who wear fine clothing are in royal palaces. Then why did you go out? To see a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. Behold, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. And then I say to you, among those born of a woman, there has been none greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The Gospel of the Lord. If you ever were a child, or if you have children, and you're going on vacation, and you're going for a long time, what do they say? Are we here yet? Are we here yet? Then you go about 10 more miles, and they said, are you? Are we here yet? Then another 10 miles, and all they're saying is, are we here yet? Then finally they get to the desp destin destination, and you say, was it worth waiting for? Was it wait worth waiting for? Those are two Christian questions on the mind of John the Baptist today. He is saying, is he the one I'm waiting for? Is it Jesus, truly the prophet? Is it Jesus I'm waiting for? Is it he that I'm waiting for? And yet, was it worth the wait for Jesus? Was it worth the wait for Jesus? I ask you the same question. Are you here? And what are you waiting for? Are we here yet with Christmas? Are we here yet with Christmas? Will it be worthwhile? Well, today you notice I'm wearing a rose color, a sign of joy today. Because Je Jesus is 10 miles away. He's not far away. And then the question will be, will it be worth it when it comes to Christmas? I'm listening on radio this morning. I can't wait for Christmas to get over. I'm so quick. I'm fed up with the shopping. He missed the whole time of Advent. He missed the whole month of Advent, the four weeks of Advent. Yes? Is it worth waiting for Jesus coming during this Advent season? Some people are tired of waiting for the union with Christ. Others are tired from waiting. There's a difference. Are you tired of waiting? Or are you tired from waiting? Because it's been a long three weeks of prayer, fasting, good works, etc. Yes, when we look at Jesus, we associate waiting with patience. And you heard Grace saying patience so often. So often. Patience is not the same as putting up with people. Patience isn't the same as putting up with Father Ed this sermon. That's not patience. You know, learning patience takes a lot of patience. Learning patience takes a lot of patience. The, the, words, the words of the gospel are waiting patiently for Jesus' coming. You know, a good example of that is the first reading about the field. The pa a farmer waits patiently for the seed to grow into a beautiful flower. He waits patiently for the fruit to come to fruition. He waits patiently for the lettuce to come out of the ground. Yes, he waits patiently, but not always. He doesn't lean back because he's very aware of the fact that God is energizing that flower. He's energizing that fruit. He's energizing that vegetable. And he does everything that works with God, through God, to see the fruit come to fruition. Yes, he waits for God to enter the, his gaze and his energize 
and into the planet. Yet since it is God himself who is patient waiting for us to allow his grace to come within us. You know, who's the most patient person in this church? God. God is waiting, waiting for, for all eternity, patiently waiting for you to become aware of his presence within you, within your own, own heart. Now, your waiting is limited. Mine is probably 10 years left, left if I'm lucky. If I don't get a heart attack from shoveling snow. But seriously, God's waiting infinitely for you to come to him. And we have a limited time for our preparation of union with Christ at Christmas. Yes, the difference is John has, all, Jesus has all the time. We just have some time left. And have you looked at it and you see, are you waiting patiently as Christ is waiting for his return and to become more and more an image of Christ at Christmas? Notice how John waited in prison. Did he wait dejectedly? Did he wait solemnly? No, he waited joyfully. And he said, are you the one? Are you the Christ, the ones that we're waiting for? He's joyfully, right in prison, joyfully waiting for Jesus and expecting Jesus. And Jesus fulfills his prophecy as we read in the first reading. He said, the blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are brought to life, and the poor have the good news preached to them. Jesus caused all our senses to become aware and open our eyes to the fact through faith that Jesus is God's gift to us. Jesus opens our eyes to see all clearly in the circumstances of our life today. A couple of days ago, yesterday I think, the day before I arrived, I got an email from a lady called Stop, uh, Elizabeth Stop. She wrote to me, she says, 54 years ago, I'm a Protestant, I still am, I'm a uh, born again Christian. But 54 years ago, I was living with my husband and having a marriage problem. This is 54 years ago. And uh, I'm not Catholic, but somebody at St. Thomas in your parish told you to go see me. And so, you know how shy I am. So I went to see her and I sat down and said, well, maybe she told me what I told her. That I told her to go to Catholic Charities in Torrington and get some marriage counseling. She says, because of that, I did divorce my husband because of mental conditions. And now I've been married a second time for 48 years and I have great grandchildren. I just want to say thank you to you. Why I thought of you 54 years later. Maybe she saw me on television, maybe she heard me on radio, whatever it is. Like somebody called me yesterday, she heard, heard me on radio Saturday. And, but I just want to say thank you. If I want to become a Catholic, I'd come to see you. Now, there is God's grace working in the ordinary circumstances of the life. One thing I learned in priesthood, the more people you, the more often you help a person, the less thank you you get. The people that are most thankful are the people that I've only helped, helped once in my life and I'm not aware of it at all. And all through my life, I get emails, I get letters, I get telephone calls saying, Father, I want to thank you for something. I say, what are you talking about? It's amazing. The person you help once never forgets. The person you hope all the time forgets to say thank you often. But what I'm saying is, oh, Jesus opens our eyes to become aware of his presence and the goodness of our person. Je Jesus opens our ears to hear the word of God and the cries of the poor. How often I get a telephone call or this Friday when we have our food share, there'll be a, over 100 people that I will hear the cry. And we will give them 100, lo 100 loaves of bread, we'll give them 100 uh, hands and non-perishables and perishables. And you hear the cry of the poor. And Jesus says, he is on our way because he's the way the truth in our life. So he's there along our way. And he brings us back to life as he did. Whenever we go to confession, like we will Tuesday night, he'll bring us back to life with the sanctifying grace. So when we come up to Holy Communion, we are filled with God's life and not sin fed, filled with or without God's life, maybe in a moral sin. Yes, Jesus comes and he opens our ears, opens our eyes, um, is our way, and he brings us back to, uh, bring, bring us back to life. And he, and he does prepare the way of the Lord. And we are, we prepare us the way of the poor, for the poor, 
He prays, prepares the poor for his way. Yes, what happened in the first reading, Jesus happens in the gospel, and what happens in the gospel happens every day in our life. Yes, to experience the signs of his creating, but you have to be prepared for Christ's coming. And uh, John the Baptist was prepared very well because he threw out four Ps. The first P was possessions. Notice in a desert he was detached from all material things. And they didn't control that. We need material things. But sometimes material things possess us. And he was detached from possessions. The second thing P he was detached from was that of pleasure. That he was out to suffer and offer for God's sake. So he lived in a de uh, desert and gave up <coughs> many of the pleasures that we, th we don't need, but we want. The pleasures that we want, but we really don't need. And the third uh, P was that of prestige. That here he was, he was the, Jesus calls him the greatest of the prophets. And yet he didn't take advantage of the fact of his position at being the greatest of the prophets. Yes, and he gave up power. He had tremendous power. People came out, all of him, all the world. He says, I'm not worthy to wear or wipe the sandals of his feet. Yes, Jesus says, this is the greatest of the prophets. Yet the least among you is greater than John. Now, what does that mean? That the kingdom of God is the presence of God within us. Through Eucharist, through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the presence of God is within us, and we are one with God. So we are even greater than John the Baptist, who only prophesies, proclaimed the coming of Jesus. We have experienced the Jesus within us through the Eucharist and through uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. So that makes us greater than John the Baptist. And then because of that, we wear this color of uh, rose, a sign of joy. But if you look in the gospel, you can look in the scriptures, you look in the God, in, in, hope, in the Old Testament, New Testament, we see joy. Rejoice, uh, Grace said, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. And remember when Mary well, received the Holy Spirit, well, when the uh, angel came, my soul rejoices in God my Savior. And remember when she, uh, Mary went to see Elizabeth, and Elizabeth saw, uh, John saw uh, Mary, he leaped with joy at the presence of Christ. And even Jesus himself rejoices in the Holy Spirit. And for this reason, my joy has been fulfilled. Yes, it Jesus promises when he says, so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be complete. That's why we call this joyful Sunday, so that we can rejoice in the coming of Christ. And when the question says, uh, are you here yet? Jesus, are you here yet? You'll say yes. And was it really worth it during these three weeks of Advent? Jesus, are you here yet? And is it, is it really worth it at these three weeks of time? Only you can say whether it is worth it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.